Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to Beasts of the Old World. Though I admit, today's subject matter tests the boundaries of the word beast, as of course the mummies were all once human, and yet now they are something wholly different, and yet still eerily similar. For mummies are not mindless undead, they are not the slave of some necromancer or vampire, nor are they a mindless base undead, as many of them retain not only their memories, but their feelings from their time amongst the living as well, making them an exceedingly rare and strange exception to the rules of unlife in the Warhammer world. But first, a word from our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, the greatest dungeon delving strategy game available for phones and PCs for free today. Command over 650 champions and equip them with an amazing plethora of gear and artifacts to destroy a wide variety of bosses and conquer the many dungeons of Teleria and then engage in a spot of relaxing PvP on the side. And speaking of people on people action, Raid has something special this month. The free Ronda Champion that can be unlocked along with equipment by logging into the game for 7 days. Ronda is based off the mixed martial arts champion Ronda Rousey whom in the Raid universe has the interesting habit of beating dragons and ice golems to death with their bare hands. This almost certainly a result of being the only girl in a family of seven brothers, minor nobility to boot which saw her compete in mock fights and tourneys from a young age, where she defeated four knights in a single bout again with just her fists. Not too surprisingly, local competitions and barroom brawls became too small scale for Ronda, who moved to the arena city of Velziar, where she became the queen of the arena without ever having picked up a weapon. And now she can be on your side. Raid even has a promo code going on Raid Ronda with a 3 day 100% XP boost, 500,000 silver and 5 full energy potions to unlock her true potential. And just in time, as Raid is also releasing a brand new dungeon, the Sand Devil Necropolis, where you can raid for the precious oil reserves within to unlock brand new powers hidden inside your artifacts. There's even a bunch of new champions on the way as well, a big December in Raid and make no mistake about it. So. Do go get the game right now with my link in the description below or by scanning the QR code visible on screen and as a new player you will receive a $30 free starter pack, the free champion Virgis and this cool in-game loot. And for Amazon Prime customers there is even further benefits. You will find all of these rewards right here in your inbox. And now on with the lore, mummies! Though that word is actually not entirely correct in the current context. It is the word most often used in Warhammer Fantasy and so it is the one we will use as well, but there are categories within that broader term, as mummy does not just refer to the mummies of Nehekara, which are of the more, well, traditional Egyptian style mummies. It can also refer to the Barrow Kings of the Empire, or even those within Bretonia or the Far North, or areas far beyond the borders of Nehekara. In reality, a mummy is a term that describes a certain type of preserved undead. It is, however, unclear which exact part of the preservation process actually creates a mummy. Because again, the ancients of Nehekara created their own mummies through their own series of rituals and embalming processes, which were obviously not followed by the savage barbarians that occupied the empire before the coming of Sigmar's people nor are they the same burial rites as carried out by those in the far north, and obviously they have nothing to do with the burial rites that sees Lord Croak 
still be up and about to this day as a mummified slum. Though Lord Croak might be a bit of an exception rather than the rule, as he's not kept in the old world through some sort of magical bond or even necessarily any sort of real preservation technique, but rather because he's Lord Croak and he's that goddamn magically powerful as to simply just ignore the fact that he's dead and keep on going in spirit form, inhabiting his old ravaged body. Whereas the mummies of the old world are not really created undead. There are many dark tales and legends of the people that inhabited the Empire before the coming of Sigmar's people again, many suggesting that they had some sort of ancient arcane knowledge, maybe even that they had an uncommon grasp of the arts of necromancy. Now this would be particularly noteworthy because at the time even the Nehekarans had barely begun to delve into and understand that secret art. And so to think then that a bunch of scattered, disorganized tribal nomads in the Empire had figured out a way to, if not perfectly replicate, then at least imitate the achievements of the Nehekaran mortuary priests, well, that would be quite something. Again, bearing in mind that Nehekara for the time was an extremely advanced society, especially in magical knowledge. The ancient predecessor people of the Empire may have developed this over centuries, perhaps due to their unique circumstances. Or maybe they were affected by outside forces. There are many, many things in the old world far older than humanity, after all. Mayhaps their grasp of necromancy was a part of the great plan of the old ones. Mayhaps it was a corruption of that great plan by chaos. I doubt the dwarves or elves taught it to them, so those two seem the most likely. And since the Barrow King do not appear overly chaotic, the old ones appear the most likely culprit. Or the ancient peoples may have happened across this knowledge by sheer bloody minded coincidence. <laughs> Odds are, they didn't even know what they were actually doing or achieving, which might sound ridiculous, like you don't just casually invent necromancy and then forget all about it, but bear in mind, many of our greatest inventions were also made by complete accident. Plastic, for example, was created after a scientist spilled something, and like, oh, that's an interesting reaction, and then perfected it over the years. Plus, when they were creating the Barrow Kings, they were not, at least not probably anyways, aiming to create an undead, as they were only awoken much, much, much later by Nagash's little um, experimentation that covered the entire globe in unholy magic for a moment, before the Skaven saved the day, that is, of course. So it's entirely possible that these old Denzians of the Empire simply preserved their warlords and leaders in a specific way that just so happened to respond well with Nagasha's magic, allowing for a rather unique set of circumstances to occur. And also, by the way, on the note of chaos, because I'm sure a fair few of you are screaming Krell right about now, Krell is not a Barrow King. Krell is a white. And yes, that is a distinction with a difference. So let's get into this a little bit, shall we? The Barrow Kings were created by Nagash when he had his great big green oomph before being killed by the Skaven, as mentioned. They were awoken by that, but they were created in almost equal part by the burial and presumably the embalming rituals of the people who laid them to rest hundreds of years previously. 
because when they awoken, they may have initially been bound to Nagash, possibly, but ever since, they have not been bound to anyone else. Many necromancers and vampires have attempted to bind Barrow kings to their will, but none have ever succeeded. Because for some reason, their unique makeup, their unique burial rituals maybe, the unique wards placed upon their graves, or perhaps simply because they were remarkable individuals in life, are somehow resistant to the usual bonds of undeath, and remain entirely in control of their own actions, thoughts, and to some degree, occasionally, in the cases of the Nehakaran mummies, feelings. Whereas the White Kings, like Krell, are, well, they are traditional undead. They may maintain a spark of independence, perhaps, a hint of lost knowledge or expertise, allowing them to fight far more ferociously and effectively than those of the lower-ranked undead, but they have no real agency. Or, well, in the case of Krell, it becomes a little bit more difficult again, as he was raised originally by Nagash personally, and has shown the ability to wage a de facto guerrilla campaign in the earliest years of the Empire. But the average White King is a relatively simple undead. Meanwhile, a Barrow King is, again, something more straddling the line between undead and human. They are able to reason out their own actions, they have their own wishes and ideas, though they are, well, rather basic, as most Barrow Kings simply want to be left alone and continue to rest away the millennia in their dusty tombs, undisturbed by anyone else. And so long as they remain undisturbed, they are unlikely to pose any real threat to nearby living, to the point that entire empire villages have sprung up near and even around Barrow Mounds, which contains, well, the living undead. The Barrow King could at any point choose to step out of his coffin and begin slaughtering the living, but he sees no need to do so, as all Barrow Kings seem to be quite content to again simply just sleep. But they can become awfully churlish if that sleep is disturbed. Obviously, they will kill intruders without mercy, and Barrow Kings often have courts of lesser undead serving them, which can also be raised at the King's command. And sometimes, merely killing an intruder is just not quite enough. A message needs to be sent so that the living will understand the relationship that is at play here, and make sure that no further grave robbers venture unwisely into the king's territory. Such reprisals could be something so simple as a haunting message, words on the wind, or creepy light shows in the dark with corpse lightning flittering across the mound, or even apparitions appearing at the villagers' borders to make sure that people get the message, or when something more strident is required. Entire villagers could be found slaughtered, dead from sheer fright and terror, with not a single wound on their body, but slightly almost scarred over places of tissue, where a Barrow King's blade has passed straight through them, tearing out the soul and leaving nothing more than a husk behind. This grumpiness upon being awoken, and their clearly rather limited ambitions, might indicate some sort of flaw in the preservative methods of the ancient people of the Empire, because of course this is rather different from the mummies of Nehekara, which may often be referred to as the princes and the kings of the tomb kings as well, as they are 
mummies, though of a completely different stripe, of course. So clearly there was something their Nehakarans knew that the ancient people of the empire did not. As many of the princes and kings, well, they run kingdoms, they run principalities, they run cities, towns, and villages, though again to very varying degrees. Some of them are entirely content to simply sleep, just like the Barrow kings are. These Nehkaran leaders have no interest in being disturbed. They too wish to simply while away the millennia, unless they are called upon by a superior king to do service in their armies. Whereas others take a very active hand in the governance of their region, again to widely varying degrees. Some of the more active kings, for example, will run entire societies, where the dead will exist right alongside the living, where the humans know full well who, or more correctly, what rules over them, but they don't really have a problem with it. It's not like the ancient king is abusing them in any way. He wants a bit of taxes, of course, like all kings for maintenance and upkeep, but far less than most living kings do, as frankly, mundane wealth matters little to a tomb king at this point. And they have access to things that other living kingdoms could never even dream of, unyielding, never sleeping sentries that patrol the walls untiringly for every hour of the night. They have access to perfectly neutral arbiters because, well, they simply don't care about the living that much, honestly. They wish to maintain law and order as well as possible, and that's about it. That's the limit of their involvement in human affairs. There is no power struggle, there is no relentless competition amongst the upper nobility, no petty wars or competitions or assassinations or other such things to disturb the day-to-day -day lives of the living. It is a scene of near-perfect stagnation with pinches of vital life scattered in here and there. And other mummies, tomb kings and princes, might run their own personal little fiefdoms in a far more hands-off-y approach, preferring to have their ancient village remain simply a ruin as far as anyone is concerned. Well, they'll make sure it has a bit of a reputation to discourage people poking about, of course, but they will not invite the living to come reside there. They will not bother rebuilding vast areas into its former splendor. They see no need to do so. They will maintain their holdings, they will patrol their pyramids and their tombs, and they will, of course, guard their riches that they had when they were living because, well, it's theirs. <laughs> they don't even have much of a use for it, as mentioned, but uh, that doesn't mean they're interested in giving it up. You could say it has um, sentimental value to them, yes. And speaking of sentimental value, this is where that whole having emotions thing come in. Because again, the Barrow Kings appear to be more simplistic variant of mummies. They very rarely have any kind of real emotion. If they have, it's a more a form of a... Um, laziness in that they don't want to do a whole lot, or a mild form of mercy in that they tolerate humans nearby so long as they don't get too close, more uncaring rather than unfeeling, should I say? Meanwhile, there was a very interesting entry in the uh, fantasy RPG bestiary that speaks of a scholar all the way from the Empire, he had travelled to Nehekara in search for a cure to a very peculiar poison with which his wife had been afflicted by some dastardly scoundrel who no doubt wanted to punish him for writing defamatory nonsense about him, God only knows. 
The point is, the knowledge to cure this poison did not exist within the Empire, but doubtlessly in some dusty tome somewhere, he found a suggestion that the cure did exist in Nehekara, or at the very least had existed thousands of years ago. And so he set off, gathering whatever possessions and wealth he had, to find the cure. But upon arrival, none of the natives were overly interested in helping him out. They didn't want to court certain death to help some crazy northerner in an almost certainly pointless quest for a mythical elixir. And so the poor scholar's only choice was um, the shadier elements of the port city he arrived in. He eventually found a roguish looking fella who was willing to take him to the set of ruins that he had found on ancient maps. He took him there as promised and said that he would stay at a nearby oasis for two days. If the scholar did not return by that time, he would simply leave because he wasn't going to risk the dangers any longer than that. The scholar delved into the ruins, hoping to find the answer to the riddle quickly, but after having spent an exhausting day under the Nehekaran sun, searching for answers and finding nothing but sand, he bedded down for the night, only to be rudely awakened when the moon was still high in the sky by bronze-tipped spears poking him gently in the ribs. Bronze-tipped spears wielded by millennia dead Nehekaran warriors. The scholar was unsurprisingly mildly perturbed by this turn of events, but they didn't seem to want to kill him, and if they did, well, he would already be dead, so he put on his clothes and then he walked where they guided him to walk. After many long minutes of wandering down, winding passageways through ruins and ancient dusty openings, he arrived in what appeared to be some sort of court, with a mummy sitting on a throne and a mortuary priest by his side. One that spoke perfect Reichspiel, apparently, which was very, very fortunate for our scholar. The priest asked him why he had come to rob the great prince of his treasure. The scholar hadn't come to do any such thing, but then he spotted his guide. <laughs> Sitting on his knees near the throne with a whole heaping load of riches all heaped up around him. The scholar was about to meet an untimely end due to the greed of his compatriot, it would seem, but... He did have an answer to the priest's question. Why had he come to rob the prince's riches? Well, he hadn't. He had come in the search of knowledge. And so, careful to work in plentiful flattery, he explained his predicament as honestly and as ass-kissingly as he possibly could. When he was done, the mummy... <laughs> did something so undoubtedly creepy as smile at him, whisper some words to his priest and then simply up and left with a quick hand gesture to decapitate the robber, of course. The Nehekaran priest took the scholar to see the knowledge that he wanted and when he asked the priest why he was doing this, the priest explained that the prince had been touched by the scholar's words, for he too had once loved someone, someone now long, long lost, far beyond the veil of time, someone he would have done anything to see one more time, and someone he can never see again. And he would never wish that pain on another. And so the scholar left with not only the knowledge he had sought, but his life as well, which is more than many can say after having uh, traipsed into a Nehekaran tomb. Some people just have all the luck. But at least now you know what you should do when you're faced with the mummy. Tell them a love story, and maybe you'll live as well. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening. And I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.